Hello, and welcome to the session on how social science research can inform AI governance with Bao Bao Zhang. My name is Melinda Wang, and I'll be your MC for the session. Thanks for tuning in, guys. So we'll first start with a 10-minute pre-recorded talk by Bao Bao, which will be followed by a live Q&A session. And you guys are probably already familiar with this by now, but you can submit your questions on the chat box on the right right-hand side of this video, and you can also upvote for your favorite questions to push them higher up the queue. And we'll, get to, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. And then after 30 minutes of questions, I'll bring the Q&A to an end, but please make an effort to stay for the mini icebreaker session afterwards. I think that this would be a really valuable opportunity for you to solidify the ideas you've learned um, and also to discuss new ideas that you may have generated during the session with other members of this community. You'll have two one-on-one -on -one sessions for a total of 20 minutes, and I'll explain what to do when we get there. But now I'd like to introduce you to the speaker to the, for this session, Bob Ball. Hello at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and a research affiliate with the Center for the Governance of AI at the University of Oxford. Her current research is focused on the governance of artificial intelligence. In particular, she studies public and elite opinion toward AI and how the American welfare state could adapt to the increasing automation of labor. Without further ado, here's Bob Ball. Hello, welcome to my virtual presentation. I hope you are safe and well during this difficult time. My name is Bao Bao Zhang and I'm a political scientist focusing on technology policy. I'm a research affiliate with the Center for the Governance of AI at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford. I'm also a fellow with the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. Today, I will talk about how social science research can inform AI governance. Advances in AI research, particularly in machine learning, have grown rapidly in recent years. Machines can outperform the best human players in strategy games like Go and Poker, they can even generate synthetic videos and news articles that easily fool humans. Looking ahead, ML researchers believe that there's a 50% chance of AI outperforming humans in all tasks by 2061. This is based on a survey that my team and I conducted in 2016. The EA community has recognized the potential risks, even existential risks, that unaligned AI systems pose to humans. Tech companies, governments, and civil society have started to take notice as well. Many organizations have published AI ethics principles to guide the development and deployment of the technology. A recent report by the Berkman Klein Center counted some 36 prominent sets of AI principles. Now we're entering a phase where tech companies and governments are starting to translate these principles into policy and practice. At the Center for the Governance of AI, or GovAI, we think that social science research, whether that's in political science, international relations, law, economics, and psychology, can inform decision-making around AI governance. For more information about the center's research agenda, please see this report. It's also a good starting place if you're curious about the topic and are new to it. Now here's a roadmap for my talk. First, I will present my research on public opinion toward AI, Next, I will highlight some EA-aligned social science research on AI governance. I'll then present some research questions that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Finally, I'll conclude by discussing how one can be impactful as a social scientist in this space. Why should we study public opinion toward AI? From a normative perspective, given that AI could impact much of society, we need to consider the voices of those who will be impacted by it. At the same time, public opinion has shaped policy in many other domains, including climate change and immigration. Studying public opinion could therefore help us anticipate how electoral politics will impact AI governance. The research I'm about to present comes from this report. It's based on a nationally representative survey of 2000 Americans that Alan Defoe and I conducted in the summer of 2018. Here are the main takeaways from the survey. Uh, first, we find that an overwhelming majority of Americans think that AI should be carefully managed. While they considered all 
13 governance challenges that we presented to them to be important, they have only low to moderate levels of trust in the actors who are developing and managing AI. Now onto some results. Here's a graph of Americans' view of AI governance challenges. Each respondent was randomly assigned to consider five, randomly selected from 13. The x-axis shows the respondent's perceived likelihood uh, that the governance challenge would impact large numbers of people around the world. The y-axis shows the perceived issue importance. The ones that were perceived to be high in both dimensions include protecting data privacy, preventing AI-enhanced cyber attacks, preventing mass surveillance, and preventing digital manipulation, all of which are highly salient topics in the news. I like to point out that the respondents consider all of these AI governance challenges to be important for tech companies and governments to manage. But we do see some variations between respondents when we break them down by subgroups. Uh, here we've broken it down by age, gender, race, level of education, partisanship, um, et cetera. And we're looking at the perceived issue importance in these graphs. Purple means greater perceived uh, issue importance. Green means lesser perceived issue importance. Here I'll highlight some differences that really pop out. In this slide, you see that older Americans compared with younger Americans perceive the governance challenges presented to them uh, to be more important. Interestingly, those with CS or engineering degrees compared with those who don't perceive all the governance challenges to be less important. We also observe this uh, techno optimism among those with CS or engineering degrees in other questions in the survey. Despite Americans perceiving that these AI governance challenges are important, they have low to moderate levels of trust in the actors who can do something about it, who are in a position to shape the development and deployment of AI systems. A few interesting observations uh, in these slides. First, the American public places relatively greater trust in the US military. This is in contrast to the ML community who would rather not work with the US military. Um, I think we get this seemingly strange result because I think the public is relying on heuristics when answering this question. While trust in institutions has declined across the board, the US public seems to still have relatively high levels of trust in the military. Another interesting observation is that the American public seems to have great distrust of Facebook. Part of it could be uh, the fallout from the Cambridge Analytica scandal. But when we ran a previous uh, survey before the scandal broke, we observed similarly low levels of trust in Facebook. I'm sharing with you just some of the results from our report. I encourage you to read it. We're currently working on a new iteration of the survey, and we're hoping to launch it concurrently in the US, EU, and China to get some interesting cross-country comparisons. Now I would like to highlight two works by my colleagues uh, in the EA community who are also working in AI governance. First off, we have Toward Trustworthy AI Development that came out recently. It's a massive collaboration between different sectors and fields to figure out how we can verify claims made by AI developers who say that their algorithms are safe, robust, and fair. This is not merely a technical question. A lot of the suggestions in this report include creating new institutional mechanisms like bounties for detecting bias or safety issues in AI systems or creating an AI instance incidents report. Second, we have the windfall clause for my colleagues from GovAI. Uh, here the team considers this idea of a windfall clause as a way to redistribute the benefits from transformative AI. Uh, this is an agreement, an ex ante agreement, where tech companies would donate a massive portion of their profits were they to make a large amount of profit from their AI systems. And this report combines a lot of research from economic history and from legal analysis to come up with a really inventive policy proposal. There are a lot of new and interesting research questions that keep me up at night, uh, and I just want to share some of them with you. Let's definitely have a discussion during the Q&A. So one of the questions that uh, keep me up is how do we 
build incentives for developing safe, robust, and fair AI systems? And how do we avoid a race to the bottom? I think a lot of us are rather concerned about the rhetoric of an AI arms race, uh, but it's also true that even a place like the EU is trying to push for competitiveness in AI research and development. I think the toward trustworthy AI development piece gives some good recommendations on the R&D front, uh, but in terms of what are the market incentives and policy incentives for businesses and the public sectors to choose the safer AI products, that's still a question that uh, I'm interested in and many of my colleagues are interested in. Another question that I think about a lot is how can we transition to a, a economic system where AI can perform many of the tasks currently done by humans. And I've been studying perceptions towards automation. Unfortunately, a lot of workers underestimate the likelihood that their jobs will be automated. They actually have an optimism bias. Uh, even correcting workers' beliefs about the future of work in my studies have failed to make them more supportive of redistribution. And it doesn't seem to uh, decrease their hostility towards globalization. So certainly there's a lot more work to be done in this space in terms of the political economy uh, around the future of work. And finally, um, I think a lot about other geopolitical risks that make AI governance more difficult. In Toby Ord's book, he talks about the risk factors that could increase the probability of existential risk. And one of these risks that he mentions is great power war. We're not at a great power war, but there's certainly a rise in aggressive nationalism from some of these great powers. Instead of coming together to combat the COVID pandemic, many countries are pointing fingers at each other. And I think these trends don't bode well for international governance. So thinking about these trends and how they can shape international cooperation around AI governance is definitely a topic that my colleagues and I uh, have been working on. Now I conclude this presentation by talking about how one can be impactful as a social scientist. I have the great luxury of working in academia where I have plenty of time to think and carry out long-term research projects. At the same time, I have to constantly remind myself to engage with the world outside of academia, to engage with the tech and policy world by writing op-eds, doing consulting, and communicating with the media. Fortunately, uh, social scientists with expertise in AI and AI policy are also in demand in other settings. Increasingly, tech companies have sought to hire those who can do research on how individual humans interact with AI systems or the impact of AI systems on society. Uh, Jeffrey Irwin and Amanda Askell have published this paper called AI Safety Needs Social Scientists. And I encourage you to read it if you're interested in this topic. To give you a more concrete example, some of my colleagues have worked with OpenAI to test whether their GPT-2 language model can generate news articles that fool human readers. Governments are also looking for social scientists with expertise in AI. Policymakers in both the civilian government and in the military have this AI literacy gap. They don't really have a clear understanding of the limits and the potentials of the technology. Uh, but advising policymakers does not necessarily mean that you have to work in government. Many of my colleagues have joined think tanks in DC where they apply their research skills to generate policy reports, briefs, and expert testimony. I really recommend checking out the Center for the Security and Emerging Technology, or CSET, based at Georgetown University. Uh, they were founded about one year ago but they have already put out a vast collection of research on AI and US international relations. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I look forward to your questions during the Q&A session. Thank you for that talk, Baba. So I see we've already had a number of questions submitted. So we're gonna get started with the first one. Um, so in general strokes, what concrete advice um, may you give to a fre fresh college graduate with um, a degree in a social science discipline? 
That's a very good question. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, in terms of general advice, one of the sort of unexpected piece of advice that I would give is that you should have strong writing skills. Um, at the end of the day, any research you do, you need to translate it to different audiences, whether that's for an academic journal or uh, if you're talking to policymakers or tech companies, uh, policy reports. Uh, besides that, I think if you want to specialize in a particular type of research, uh, for me, uh, learning data science and statistics is really important for the type of research that I'm doing. For other folks, it might be game theory, or for folks doing qualitative research, it might be how to do ethnographies, how to do elite interviews. But overall, I think having strong writing skills is quite critical. Great. Um, Ryan asked, what are the current talent gaps in AI safety right now? Um, that's a good question. I must confess I'm not an AI safety expert, although I did talk about uh, this piece that folks at OpenAI have written called AI Safety Needs Social Scientists. And I definitely agree um, with the sentiment, given that the folks who are working on AI safety, they want to run experiments. Uh, you can think of them as uh, psych experiments. And uh, a lot of computer scientists are not necessarily trained on how to do that. So if you have skills in running surveys or running uh, psych experiments, I think this is uh, a skill set that hopefully other tech companies will acknowledge and recognize that, wow, this is really important. That's really interesting. Um, would you consider psychology to be uh, within the realm of social science as people generally perceive it, um, or uh, more like STEM fields? Um, I think psychology is quite interesting. Um, it probably depends on uh, people who are more on the neuroscience side might be more STEM, but there's I, I work with some experimental psychologists, particularly social psychologists, and they read a lot of the literature in economics or political science and communication studies. Um, so I do think that there's a bit of overlap. Um, so suppose like going off this question now, how important do you consider interdisciplinary studies to be, whether that's like constrained within the realm of social science or like social science with STEM, um, et cetera? Um, I think it's important to work both with other social scientists and with uh, computer scientists. Uh, one of the realizations that I made, this is more sort of career advice, not related to AI governance, but recently I've been working on a bunch of COVID projects um, and having the expertise uh, so that you're not just an armchair public health person is really important. So. Uh, I try to get my team to talk with those who are either in vaccine development or uh, epidemiologists or those who work in public health. And I'd like to see more of that type of collaboration in the AI governance uh, space. And we do that quite well, I think, at GovAI, where we do have in-house people at FHI who are computer scientists that we can talk to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's a really interesting point. It relates to one of the questions that was just asked about um, how can we more um, effectively promote these international cooperation? Uh, do you have any like concrete strategies that you may advise? Yeah, so uh, international cooperations, that, that's a really good uh, question. So I do work a bit with folks who are in the uh, uh, European Union, uh, AI governance space and bring my expertise to the table. My uh, The team that I'm working with, we just submitted today a um, consultation to the, uh, your, uh, the EU Commission. So that type of work is definitely necessary. Um, I also think that collaboration with folks who work on AI policy in China is also a really fruitful um, area of Collaboration in the U.S., I do worry about uh, the decoupling between U.S. and China. So there's a bit of a um, 
there's a bit of tension. But if you're in Europe and, and you do want to collaborate with Chinese researchers, um, I, I encourage it. Um, I, I think this is a area uh, that more folks should look into. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a really good point. I guess uh, in relation to the last talk regarding biosecurity, um, the I guess the topic of info hazards was uh, was very much staked upon. So I guess within the realm of AI governance, can you think of any particular info hazards? That's that's a good question. Um, we do think a lot about all of our publications um, at GovAI. We talk about being careful in our writing so that we don't necessarily escalate tensions between countries. I think that's definitely think something that we think about. Um, at the same time, there is this sort of open science movement uh, in the social sciences. So that's a tricky balance that we play, but we definitely don't want to uh, certainly we want to make sure our work is accurate and uh, speaks to our overall mission at GovAI of uh, promoting, you know, beneficial AI and not doing harm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess a more specific question um, someone asked was, um, do you think uh, this in this concept of info hazards, if it's a, a big problem in AI governance, would um, prohibit one from uh, spreading ideas uh, within the realm, for example? That's a good question. I, I think um, I think the EA community is quite careful about not um, spreading info hazard. Uh, we're quite deliberate in our communication, but I do worry about a lot of the rhetoric that other folks who are in this AI governance space are uh, saying, right? So there are people who want to drum up this uh, potential AI arms race, people who say, you know, competition is the only thing that matters. And I think that's sort of the dangerous rhetoric that we want to avoid. Because we don't want a race to the bottom where, uh, whether it's US, China, or the EU, uh, they only care about competition without thinking about the potential risks of uh, deploying AI systems that are not safe. Mm -hmm. um, great. So we're going to shift gears a little bit um, into uh, more of the nitty gritty of uh, the talk. So one question that was asked is, how do you expect public attitudes toward AI to differ by nationality? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in the talk, I mentioned that GovAI, we're hoping to do this big survey later on where we're running it co-currently in different countries. Um, judging from what I've seen of the literature, uh, Eurobarometer has a lot of good surveys uh, in the EU. I do think that uh, sort of from what you would expect, folks in, living in Europe tend to be more concerned about privacy. Um, they have tougher privacy laws and so that's to be expected. Uh, but it's not necessarily so that uh, Chinese uh, respondents are totally okay with lack of privacy. Um, so we're hoping to do this survey by asking them the same questions at around the same time, because I think that's really important to make these cross-national comparisons. A lot of questions, uh, you get different responses because of question framing or question wording. So doing the rigorous social science can uh, really give a better answer to this question. Yes, yeah, so I guess um, I'd like you to unpack that a little more. So extrapolate, extrapolating from the last question, um, I guess in what concrete ways can we be more culturally sensitive in stratifying these AI risks uh, when it comes to international collaboration? I think speaking the right language is really important. Uh, just when, for instance, uh, this is a, I guess a concrete example. So when I'm 
my when my team is working on this EU uh, consultation, we talked to folks who work at uh, the European Commission so that we can understand what are the particular concerns and speak their language, so to speak. And, and, and one of the things that they're really concerned about, yes, they're concerned about the AI uh, competition, potentially arm race, but they don't want to use that language. Uh, they care a lot about human rights and privacy. And so when we're making recommendations, those are the two things that we try to balance because we uh, read their reports and we've spoken to people who are involved in the decision making. Uh, and in terms of the survey research that we're hoping to do, we're getting a lot of consultation from folks on the ground so that our translation work is uh, localized so that it's uh, that has the cultural nuances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point about, um, I guess, uh, using the right language, which also makes me think that, you know, how people in the social science realm uh, often think differently and may use different language than people from the STEM realm, for example. And uh, the clash of those two cultures could sometimes result in similar um, conflicts uh, as a like clash of cultural um, conflicts. So I'm wondering um, whether you have any advice on how to mitigate those conflicts. Yeah, that's a good question. So recently GovAI published um, a guide to making uh, impacts statements that are uh, required for NeurOps, um, the, the conference. And one of the suggestions I think that came out of that is if you're working with, if computer scientists are sort of trying to figure out what the uh, societal impact of their uh, research is, maybe it's good to talk with social scientists who are uh, who can help them do this translational work. So I think, again, the interdisciplinary uh, research team strategy is quite important. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there is, I think you alluded uh, to this in your talk as well, but do you think there's a general literacy gap between these different domains? And if so, how should these gaps be filled? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so my colleagues, uh, Mike Horowitz and uh, Sarah Kahn uh, at UPenn have written a piece uh, about the AI literacy gap in government, and they acknowledge that it's a real problem. Uh, and it would be uh, certainly uh, training courses, crash courses to train policymakers or to train social scientists who are interested in advising policymakers that's one way to go about it. Uh, but I do think that uh, if you wanna work in this space, doing the deep dive, not just doing the crash course can be really valuable. And then you can be the person who can offer the instruction. You could be the ones writing the uh, guide material. Um, so yeah, I, I do think there's a need to increase the average level of AI literacy but also uh, important for the social science master's programs or PhD programs to be able to train people who are more expert in this field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, um, which brings up a really uh, interesting question by Chase. Uh, so has there been more research into the source of techno optimism from CS slash engineering grads? as an overconfidence in their own education or in fellow devs slash engineers? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So we're, we're um, surveying machine learning researchers uh, at GovAI, and this is future research that we're hoping to share um, later this year. And I can't speak, you know, directly to that research, but I do think that there is a, perhaps a U-shape curve uh, where on the x-axis is your uh, level of expertise in AI and your on the y-axis is your level of concern about AI safety or risks from AI. Uh, so those who don't have a lot of expertise, they're kind of concerned. But those who have CS or engineering degrees are uh, perhaps 
not so worried. But then if you talk to machine learning researchers themselves, and a lot of them are concerned, I think they're waking up to uh, recognizing that what they work on can have huge societal impacts. You have folks who work in AI safety who are, you know, very concerned about this. But in general, I think that AI machine learning field uh, is also waking up to these, recognizing these potential risks, given, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, this proliferation of AI ethics principles uh, coming left and right from all these different organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting how um, the public is for once aligned with the experts in ML. Um, I suppose in, in this instance, the public is pretty enlightened. Um, I'm not sure if this question was asked already. I, I don't believe it was, but are organizations working in AI governance more funding constrained or talent constrained? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think at this point, I can't speak for all organizations, but I do think that there is, uh, can I just make a plug? Uh, so I, I do think that uh, GovAI, we're looking to hire folks uh, in the upcoming months. Um, we're looking for someone to help us on survey projects. Um, and we're also looking for a project manager and other researchers. So in, in some sense, you know, we have the funding and that's great. And now we're just looking for folks who can do the research. So that's my plug. Uh, I can't speak for all uh, organizations, but I do think that there is a sort of a, a, a gap in terms of training people to do this type of work. Uh, I'm going to be a faculty member at a public policy school, and they're just beginning to offer AI governance as a course. Um, so there is a bit of a gap and for people who are interested, certainly uh, a lot of self-study is helpful, but hopefully we'll be able to get these courses into the classrooms at law schools, at public policy schools, at different PhD programs or master's programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think um, perhaps the motivation behind that question uh, was more along the lines of um, I guess AI governance is not specific to EA per se, but a lot of um, there's a general a general current trend that a lot of um, organizations in EA are extremely competitive to get into, um, especially you know uh, EA specific job posts. Um, and I'm wondering whether you can provide like a realistic figure for how talent constrained um, AI governance is uh, as opposed to being funding constrained. Yeah, I, I can't speak to the funding side, but in terms of the uh, research, human resource side of things, um, I think we're beginning to finally have some concrete research questions, but at the same time, we're building out new research questions. And it's hard to predict what type of skill set that you will need necessarily. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, GovAI has realized, oh, all these different social science skills are really important, uh, whether that's doing survey research, whether that's doing legal analysis, or whether it's doing, you know, elite interviews, more sort of on the sociology side, um, or doing translational work. So I don't have a good answer to that question, uh, but I think getting some sort of expertise uh, in one of the social sciences and having expertise in AI policy or AI safety, that's the type of, uh, those are the type of skills that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, given that we have uh, six minutes left, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and just try to get through as many questions as possible. Um, let's see. Uh, what insights from nuclear weapons governance can inform AI governance? Um, that's a, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think you've caught me here. 
I think um, some insights that I have uh, is um, the dual use nature of nuclear weapons. Um, people talk about AI as a as a general purpose technology, um, and it could be uh, used for both um, benefits and harms. And sort of speaking from my own uh, expertise in public opinion research, one of the interesting uh, findings in this space is people tend to reject nuclear energy because of its association with nuclear weapons. So there's a wasted opportunity cost because uh, nuclear energy is quite uh, cheap and not as uh, harmful to, as, say, burning fossil fuels. But because of this negative association, we sort of rejected nuclear energy. And thinking about AI, what I think about in terms of trust in AI systems, we don't want it to have a situation where people's association of uh, AI systems is so negative that they reject applications that could be beneficial to society. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I do recommend some of my colleagues who work in the international relations space uh, at organizations like CSET who have written about this. I'm sorry, it's not my area of expertise. Okay. Um... The next question is, is there a way we can compare public trust in different institutions specifically regarding AI compared to a general baseline trust in that institution? So I suppose in this case, um, the US military may have uh, a greater trust um, across you know, all domains in general from the public. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I think in terms of the public at this point, because AI is so new, people are relying on their heuristics rather than um, their, what they know. <laughs> um, so they're just gonna rely on what they think about what's a trustworthy institution. And one thing that I've sort of noticed uh, that I uh, wrote about in my Brookings report is some of the areas of political polarization uh, around uh, AI governance sort of maps onto what you would expect to find in other domains. And that's a little bit concerning if we can't uh, agree on what's the right policy solution, if we're just going to map the partisan rhetoric onto uh, AI governance in the US context, at least. Uh, to give you a few examples, uh, Acceptance, official recognition software, really maps onto race and uh, your partisanship. So African-Americans really distrust facial recognition. Democrats tend to distrust facial recognition, whereas Republicans tend to have a greater level of acceptance. So you see this uh, attitudes towards policing being mapped onto facial recognition. Uh, you also see this in terms of regulation of um, algorithmically curated social media content, um, where there seems to be a, a bipartisan tech clash, but when you dig deep into it, uh, as we've seen recently, Republicans tend to think about content moderation as uh, censorship against the right, whereas Democrats tend to see it as combating misinformation. Um, so unfortunately, I do think that partisanship will creep in to the AI governance space. Uh, and it that's something that I'm actively studying. Mm -hmm. um, so we only have one minute left. I'm going to uh, go through the last question really fast. Uh, so with regards to the specific data that was presented, um, I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned the public considered all those governance challenges important. Did you consider including a made-up governance challenge to check response bias? Oh, that's a really good suggestion. We haven't, uh, but we certainly can uh, do that in the next round. Uh, that's a good suggestion. 
Great. Okay, um, wonderful. And that concludes the Q&A part of this session. Uh, again, please stay for the mini icebreaker session. We think this can be a really good way to understand and solidify what you've learned and exchange new ideas. If you check the session description below this video, you'll find a link to the icebreaker session and another moderator will meet you on the other side. Thanks for watching, guys.